going to get started. Thank you all for being here. This is the last lecture in our series of free lectures for Autism Awareness Month. We're always so happy to share free information to the community. This will be and is currently being recorded um, and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to spread the news to um, anybody who wasn't able to be here this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Daniela Fazio. She's been with Alpine a relatively short time, but feels like a lifetime. I've had the good fortune of working with Daniela when I was on sabbatical out in California. And um, I knew right away just how talented she was when I saw how enthusiastic she is working with learners and the connections that she had with staff when I was there. And um, I feel really fortunate that she decided to make the move and come join us at Alpine Learning Group. She has many, many years of experience. She's a board certified behavior analyst. Um, she's worked as part of ASAT's Board of Directors, which is the Association for Science and Autism Treatment. She's um, a, a very talented clinician and I'm very, very happy she's part of the Alpine family. So I'm gonna let her take it away. I will be um, uh, monitoring the chat. We will have some time at the end of the presentation for questions and, um, and there'll be a few videos that she'll show throughout and um, hopefully you will um, get a lot of information about teaching young children with autism communication skills. I'll let Dr. Fazio take it away. Thank you so much. That was uh, very generous. Dr. Taylor, it is my honor to be at Alpine and my honor to be part of this uh, series. Um, thank you for the friendly faces who are here and everyone who decided to spend a good chunk of your night with us. I hope that you'll get um, information that you're looking for here. Um, this talk is relatively basic. I know I already saw some behavior analysts in the list of participants, and we also have some um, of our own therapists who probably have heard me talk about these things between a little bit and a lot. Um, so if you, um, are already in the field. I hope that this might help model how I try to talk to families or younger professionals about the topic that we're gonna talk about today. Um, there is an outline here. This is what we're going to be talking about, communication and motivation, why. I am certain that almost everyone who's here came because there's the word communication um, in the title. And we'll talk about what exactly is motivation and why we're putting the two together to talk about um, early learners with autism. I'm calling the behavior goggles uh, the part where I'm going to talk to you about how to look at behavior, see it for more than just that action, and consider the all the conditions happening around the behavior because that's going to help us see and really maximize learning. We'll go over some types of communicative behavior and communication milestones, and then how to uh, contrive some situations so that we can have more learning opportunities than we would have otherwise if we just wait um, for a child to maybe show us that they're motivated. So getting into communication, why um, we decided to talk about this, obviously it is such an essential life skill. It is markedly delayed in children with autism. Uh, it is, in fact, an essential characteristic um, for the diagnosis of ASD. It can be taught, and that is what we spend most of the time that we um, are together with the young learners in early intensive behavioral intervention. It improves outcomes also in other areas. Obviously, it is just um, important to everything that we do. And also for 
the future adaptive performance. If we have, we're going to talk about very basic communication, but you know, it's we never stop having to learn how to communicate more and better in more sophisticated ways. So we invest all that we can in teaching communication to our young learners. Um, I will talk about this a couple of times to remind everyone that communication is much more than talking. We, of course, are always trying to teach learners to talk and we don't give up and we work on what we call the vocal behavior, but there's so much more to communication um, than just talking. And we will talk about in, in the milestones, how many of them are actually well before a child says their first words. Now to motivation, um, some important uh, characteristics of how we're going to define motivation and talk about it in this talk. In general terms, what is motivation? It is involved in the reasons why we act or we behave in a particular way. So we tend to say, I didn't do it because I wasn't motivated to do it, or I'm going today because I'm pretty motivated. There is more to that than exactly what we say. Um, the learners that we teach have particular characteristics when it comes to motivation. Sometimes we have very restricted motivation. Sometimes we have very fleeting motivation, motivation that doesn't really, really last long enough for us to do as many teaching opportunities as we need to. Um, and getting motivation right is really key to engaging learners and to actually teaching effectively. It's at the core of applied behavior analysis and uh, we would be talking about motivation even if we weren't talking about early communication skills, but because we are, it is that much more important to really understand what motivates and what we can actually do with the motivation that we have so that we can maximize learning. So motivation, I'm gonna call it a condition and I'll have a few slides that will really drive this point home. It's pretty transient and it is affected by many variables. Some of them we're gonna discuss. So this is to say that I might be motivated by something, but kind of the degree of motivation varies a lot and it is manipulable, it's teachable. So you might identify motivation occurring and we need to do this for our young learners. I, I believe I'll say several times throughout the presentation, we need to meet our learners where they are. And, um, but we can also teach motivation. So a lot of what we're gonna do is put, see motivation where it really belongs and how it's going to motivate children to actually engage in the communicative behaviors. I like to make the distinction, it's not an inner force. In our kind of common language, we tend to say that a lot, like, oh, if they really wanted, they would do it. Or I just, you know, it's just not in me. And I want to talk about motivation as something that is, it, it depends on the success of some behaviors in the environment, it depends on uh, what we're calling motivation. And it's, it's not in there waiting for it. We can actually um, do a lot to motivate, even if it might appear that in there, that you're not motivated. And it is not constant. So moving to the behavior goggles, I like to use behavior goggles because it's kind of a quick way to say, oh, put them on. And now when you're looking at a behavior, you're no longer just seeing that action. Let's say a child saying a certain word. What you're seeing is everything that happens around that behavior to make that behavior happen or not happen or when it should happen, when it should not happen. So the goggles are for you to see more around the situation um, where that behavior is happening or need to happen, then you would just otherwise um, see if you aren't receiving training on how to understand why we do what we do. 
Um, <clears throat> so the goggles tell us how to see behavior. We're going to see some components that are essential for us to talk about behavior, and we're going to talk about communication. But this is really how we explain behavior and how we can actually make behavior happen and not happen if we can see all of these components. And if we know where motivation is and use it to affect maximum learning. If you can see all of these components, you can think about ways to make sure that all of them are where they need to be for behavior to happen and not happen. I'll make a note in a couple of slides about problem behavior, which is when we don't want behavior to happen, but that's not gonna be the um, main topic of tonight's talk. So these are the components that the goggles help you to see. Many of you might be already very familiar with the ABC. If you had any contact with applied behavior analysis, you heard of the ABC. This is the basic way that we want to see when the behavior usually happens or when it's supposed to happen, the actual behavior that we're gonna always be trying to define really well. What behavior is that? Is communication a word, a sentence, um, a gesture, and then what the consequence for the behavior is. And you see that the color is different. And we're gonna see pink as the consequence and the motivation together all the time. It's kind of a strategy so that when you think of consequence, you're gonna immediately think motivation. So think about these four components. Uh, they're gonna be really important for us to identify motivation and decide when do I teach what and how do I make my child motivated to engage in this communicative behavior. It's really going to depend on that consequence. The pink arrow that you'll see over and over here is to indicate that that consequence acts on that behavior. In applied behavior analysis, we don't use the term feedback. We use the term reinforce. So that consequence might reinforce the behavior and the behavior is gonna happen again or not. I'll explain it as feedback because I think that's how everybody understands. There's an action and there's an effect and that effect is gonna change that action in the future. Like when you get feedback at work or in automatic processes of feedback, that's what the consequence does. It communicates something to the behavior and what it's gonna communicate is, great, I'm here for you, you did it or eh, not so much. So it's a feedback situation. So to always remember the ABC, the ABC, antecedent is not something that we remember very easily. So that's just what happens before the behavior. It's the when, right? So it's very important. We do want to pay attention to when, like what happened for that behavior to happen. When is it appropriate? But that's just the before. It doesn't determine the motivation. It doesn't determine, you know, if this behavior is going to continue happening or not. What's really going to help that behavior stay, the child to be motivated to engage in that communication is the consequence, the after, the result, because it feedbacks, okay? So what's this other pink thing that keeps coming up. That's what tells us that that consequence, that after, that what I'm gonna call the motivating consequence, because we want it to motivate the behavior, right? The talk is about motivating behavior. That consequence is sometimes very strong and sometimes not so strong. As I said, motivation is really variable. So sometimes, I, I know what my child wants and maybe they like two things, but they like those two things so, so, so much. I think that's all I need to have, those two motivating consequences. I have the bubbles and I have the iPad. And sometimes that's not gonna be sufficient. I'll say, I'm doing this as a consequence to the communication behavior and, it, and it's, not, it's not working, I'm not seeing more behavior. The motivating conditions are what I'm calling 
the effects that some things will have on the power of the consequence. So we need to know what's the motivating consequence, but we also need to keep in mind that the value of that consequence varies. And I'll have several examples now. I'm gonna go through relatively quickly, um, keeping my time here. So we uh, really understand when something is more motivating and when it's, it might be time to actually use something else as the motivator because we might have exhausted for that hour or for that day, the strength of um, something that we're using. So these are like the easiest kind of day-to-day, -day, our own experience that we can relate to. The pink words are those motivating conditions. So we know that if we're seeking warmth, if warmth is a motivating um, consequence for me, I'll do what it takes to get the warmth, but more if I'm really cold. So I think about, you know, you're at night watching TV, super cozy, and you're really interested in the movie, you have your popcorn, and your drink, and then you start feeling really cold and you think, oh, I don't wanna pause the movie, put the, my pop popcorn away, go upstairs, open the drawer, get put my sweater on. You like, I, 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 I don't think I'm gonna do it. Well, if you're really, really cold, that warmth is gonna be that much stronger in terms of motivating all this behavior that I just said you have to engage in to get your sweater on. This is all to say you're gonna do more if that motivating consequence is stronger and it is stronger based on something, some condition. So cold, hunger, thirst, loneliness, tired, like satiation, right? If I just had um, a big, big, big glass of water, there isn't that much I'm going to do to get water. So this is just the, a general non-young children communication examples to help understand that how the strength of those motivating consequences can change. And we need to, and, and for our learners, I think it changes that much faster. Sometimes you think, oh, yay, they really, really want those chips. And after two chips, that's it, no more. So I need to really be reading their kind of body language and behavior to make judgments about the strength of that consequence, the motivating consequence at all times. So I just said, I'm, I have the visual now, I, if I'm cold, I'm going to do more to result in the warmth. So anything that brings me warmth when I'm cold, I'm motivated to do, right? So that's motivation to behave. It's not motivation to get warm. Because as we start talking about what the kids really want, and sometimes it's candy, sometimes it's iPads, sometimes it's things that I hear a lot from parents, I don't want them to just have that. My mission is to say, if, if that's what is a motivating consequence, that's where we are at. So we're going to use that because that's gonna motivate behavior. And once behavior starts happening, it contacts other things in the environment. I might be learning to communicate just because I really, really, really want that iPad, but eventually I'm going to see what kinds of all different things communicating gets me. If I'm hungry and I see the cookie, I'm going to do a lot more to get that cookie because I'm hungry. So the, the middle um, square there is always the behavior, right? So we're going to start seeing what kinds of behaviors. Now, if I just ate and I'm full of cookies and I feel really cold and I see the cookies, that's not, it's a motivating condition, right? We just saw that I'm like, I'm all for the cookies. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna open. But if I'm full of cookies, is that cookie gonna be a strong motivating condition um, consequence for me? Not so much. So we have, the task to identify what are motivating consequences and to use those consequences at the right times because different conditions in our environment will change the value of um, that motivation. I hope you're still all with me. Now I'm full of cookies and I'm kind of cold and I might be also be pretty thirsty. 
So in that case, if I thought, oh, I'm still here giving my child cookies, you know, ask them to say cookies because Nicole said, that's our target. Well, I have a child full of cookies now and really thirsty. So I think what's gonna really be motivating at this point is water, or I'm just gonna watch. Are they still even trying to reach for the cookie? Did they just turn around and like walk to, uh, walk to the kitchen at some point? So trying to understand what they're probably looking for right now is gonna tell me what should I be using as a motivating consequence and what behavior I'm gonna work on right now for that communication will have to do with that motivating consequence early on in teaching. I have a couple of examples in case we're not, you know, in the shoes of the children we're teaching right now that might help understand for the parents. I have a parent who has a rule of no electronics during the evening. So the behavior right in the middle there is the behavior we're gonna be trying to um, motivate the parent to do, right? So the kids ask for the iPad after dinner and I'm not gonna do it. So I know what I need to do. I'm gonna offer two toys. I'm gonna teach them how to play with these toys. They're educational toys. We're gonna have 30 minutes. What's the consequence there for my behavior as the parent? I feel great. I follow through with my role. That for me is huge. If I could only follow through with all my roles for myself, I'd be great. And the kids are learning how to play. They play with educational toys. So that consequence really motivates me to put in that extra effort at the end of the day and say no to the iPad. It's very important to me. I will be motivated to play and, you know, insist with them that they'll play the, with the toys and not the iPad. But... Here's a day where I homeschooled three kids. I fed them three meals, went through two temp temper tantrums, had a fight with a neighbor about the car in the driveway. The kids asked for the iPad. Remember, I'm motivated to teach them how to play with the educational toys. But that consequence right now is really weak because I'm exhausted. I don't know if I have it in me to say, no, we're not going to play the iPad. We're going to play 30 minutes of educational toys. So it's not that I'm not motivated to play with the kids. Is the exhaustion of the day has changed the value of that consequence at this point for me. Okay. This is a basic, I left San Francisco just one year ago um, example. So. The motivating condition situation for me today is this one. Look at everything that I did. I did not have my morning coffee, woke up late, was rushing, no breakfast, no coffee, worked out, showered, got dressed, gave a 60 minute presentation. By the time it's 10 a.m., the antecedent is me thinking about the coffee. I, can't, I can almost smell that coffee. I can see the coffee in my head. I'm gonna leave the house, walk four blocks and pay a lot of money to get that coffee. I'm very motivated in the behavior that results in coffee for me, okay? Now, had I had a relaxing morning, I had my cup of, a cup of coffee at 6 a.m. By 10, you probably could not get me out of the house to walk and pay a lot of money for a coffee. Okay, so I am very motivated by delicious coffee. What I'm gonna do to get to it really depends on how satiated I am, or how deprived of coffee I am, the amount of energy I had to spend or still have to. So it works for everyone. Switching gears now to the types of communicative behaviors. So we know we're here to teach the children to communicate. We know everything about motivation right now. That consequence is really important. I need to read the child to see what they're interested in. And I need to consider, is this the best time to put this motivated contingency in the line? And are they going to do something for it? So what am I going to teach in terms of communication? There are many here. We're gonna focus on the request. And I'm also going to give examples of how we can turn all of the other ones into requests. Why? 
because the request is the closest one to really hitting that motivation. So if early on I can make more things happen that the child wants, I'm working on all of these behaviors. They all look different or sound different. Some are actually about even understanding communication, but they're very linked to motivation. I'll make that note about challenging behavior right now before I go back to talk about these repertoires. Just because challenging behavior also communicates um, information about motivation. They communicate wants and needs. Motivation can be inferred directly from challenging situations, in fact. The goggles work just the same if the behavior was mommy cookie or if the behavior was a big temper tantrum. They inform us about what's valuable and what motivating consequence is important in this situation. So just as we would identify the motivating consequences, apply them to communication behavior that you want to see. Don't apply them to communication behavior that you don't want to motivate. How, how do we do this? Behavior that happens when something is taken away tells you a lot about what's valuable and important for that child. That item that you just took away Behavior that happens when something is denied to the child tells you about the child's level of motivation for that item. And behavior that happens until you attend to it also tells you something about the degree of motivation of this child by your attention, attending to their behavior. So just an aside that we're gonna talk about the communicative behaviors that are um, adaptive, but if you have problem behavior, they are also communicating to you um, a lot about motivation. So let's go back. We're gonna talk again about these requests. And we're gonna talk about different behaviors that are communication, and we're gonna make them all work in sort of the highest motivation situations, but we're gonna to try to see if kids will repeat what we're saying, if they're gonna do something that we ask them, and so on. I'm gonna start with the requesting because that's the star of tonight's presentation. And what motivating condition is going to make requesting um, the strongest? It's wanting it, okay? So when I'm trying to teach a child to request, this child needs to want it. Sometimes it's difficult to know what they want so we're like, here's all the things that you like, you know, tell me which one you want. And sometimes it still is not what they want. So we're gonna be always on the lookout for what are they seeking? You might need to show them a few things and see what do they actually approach. And if they take it, do they even keep it or do they just, just toss? It happens all the time. So to teach to request, I will see that a child actually saw the cookie and is trying to approach the cookie, take the cookie, steal the cookie, can't keep their eyes off the cookie. And that's a good time to teach the child to maybe say the word cookie, if they can already say. Giving the cookie when they say cookie is going to teach them to be motivated to say cookie when they want the cookie. We might be talking about a sign. You can also sign cookie. Whatever informs me at this point, wherever this child is at, that they just told me I want the cookie. And we're gonna look at those communication milestones and talk about what other behaviors tell me what the child wants. Um, I might also be teaching the child to repeat, and I'm gonna put this in the contingency of you're motivated by something, you're gonna get what you're motivated for. But the behavior that I asked for you is actually to repeat what I said. So I'm training repeating in the same context of, oh, I identified the motivation, here's the behavior that I want. So if the child is looking like they want the cookie, I'm gonna say food. The child says food and they're gonna get the cookie, okay? Um, I might ask them to repeat other words. So if they already learned to say cookie, I might start varying 
what it is that I'm teaching. So it might be mom says yummy, say yummy, and they say yummy. There's going to be feedback there. Hopefully they're more likely, they're motivated to repeat what I say because at the peak of their motivation for the cookie, I said, say yummy. Fill ins, short words, high motivation. In this example, dad is playing with a child physical play up and down, up and down. At some point, he kind of stops and looks at the child to see if the child, does it look like they want more or they're like, just, you know, put me down. Looks like they want more. Dad might say up and, and wait for the child to say down. So the child has just requested down, requested to continue the play by filling in. So if the child already has this repertoire of filling in, this is a great strategy to use the motivation to get them to communicate, to ask. Labeling. So we already taught them to say cookie. We already taught them that cookies food. We already taught them mm, it's really yummy. They can repeat. I might be using the highest motivation of the child to now teach some other things. Color, for example. So the cookie might even say cookie. I'm like, they really want this. And we're working on color. So I'm gonna say what color. When they answer, then they can get the cookie. Um, you can teach the child to understand you, right? So they're not, they now understand your own communication. So same story, dad is doing physical play. They tickled a little bit. It looks really fun. The child looks like more. So dad moves away a little bit and says, come here. And the child comes to get more tickles, okay? So we're just kind of throwing in that little communicative response um, under the highest motivating conditions. So I'm not gonna ask the child to come here when you know they need to go to the bathroom and I know that they hate. Best time to teach them to come here is when they are seeking me. They really want to get to me for me to do what they wanted. Showing. So if the child just, again, same, same story with the cookie, they want the cookie, they indicated they want the cookie, I might say, oh yes, we're gonna get some cookies, pick green. Child points to green, gets the cookie. So teaching the child, again, they communicate to me and they can understand communication all using these highest motiva mot motivating consequences and conditions. A quick note about imitation and signs. If you already have a child who can imitate, you can also be teaching signs. I want to reassure usually parents, we're not giving up on the vocal behavior, but we should not wait for a child to be able to produce words to teach them communication. They were missing some communication milestones. We just trying to catch up. It's only fair to the child. So if a sign is what's going to be the best communicative response to teach right now, it's going to meet the child's needs and teach them, oh, I do something and I get something and you do something for me or with me, sign it is. So it, that could be that too. And they don't need to be perfect. Next to communication milestones, just to talk about, um, again, so what kinds of communication behaviors are we teaching? I kind of exhausted them from the literature of verbal behavior. So for those who obviously recognize, these are the most basic communication behaviors and some of them are vocal, some of them are not. I'm gonna go through a little bit of communication milestones to again emphasize there's vocal communication and there's non-vocal communication. They're all verbal because they're communicating with someone else, we call them the verbal community, and there, there is feedback to that communicative behavior. Talking and much more than talking. Before um, children learn, like, uh, learn to talk, 
as babies, they engaged in many communication behaviors that developed slowly into more sophisticated behaviors naturally. I want to qualify what naturally is. It just means in response to the natural consequences. The principles are the same. There was motivation, then there was a consequence, and that was feedback to the, the baby's behavior, and that the baby did that again, and that consequence happened again, and then they learned. The only difference here is that for us, it takes extra, extra additional effort to teach. The level of motivation might not be the same. So our children maybe miss some of these communication milestones because the natural consequences didn't really, they weren't strong enough to affect our behavior or there weren't enough that were actually motivating. So we're just going to make them happen. So we have to target those behaviors so they can develop into more sophisticated communication. Um, and we'll take a look at um, zero to one, a lot of non-vocal behaviors and early, early vocal behaviors that are part of the communication milestones that we want to be teaching. This is from the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. There's a big table here, but I'm going to break it down. So this is the communication section there. Left is um, receptive communication. So what the children would be understanding on the right is expressive just to see how much communication is going on before the first words, okay? I'll go relatively quickly through them, but like getting quiet when you listen to it, when you hear a sound, um, smiling at people is an early communication skill. So I can use motivating consequences for that too, right? A sibling did something really nice, My my, the child I'm working on smiled. Wow, here's a motivating consequence. This is great communication behavior because something I'm not gonna go into detail because we just have one hour is if you see the behavior happening already, throw that motivating consequence there, right? It's not only when we set up or we're like following the child to see what they want. You're gonna have many opportunities throughout the day that to identify, oh, they just looked at me when I said a word. I remember Daniela saying that's an early communication milestone. I want to have a motivating consequence to give to this child right now. Seven months to a year. So see on the right, the first, like one or two words are starting to happen. For a lot of children, not even yet. Playing social games is part of communication. And here are some examples from the Alpine um, curriculum. You see that almost all of them start with request because, again, if we're emphasizing uh, motivation so much, we're going to want to work with the requesting. Looking at an adult is a great communicative response. Looking at requesting by looking at the item. So if the adult's present, looking at the item might be enough to communicate to the adult, oh, that's what you want. It's a really, really early learning skill, but you can see how it is communicating to the adult what the child wants. And it's communicating to the child that when you look at something, I see it, you just told me something. Leading adults to items, for some of the learners we work with, this happens sometimes inadvertently and they're already doing that. And it's time for us to go to the next level. But if they're not, this is a good way actually for them to really see that they can tell us what they want and we can make it happen for them. Requests by giving items. So here, put the item in your hand to indicate that that's what they want making choices. I should have left making choices at the end because um, more often than not, we try to give children a lot of choices when they're not really even ready to kind of scan all of the options. They don't know exactly how to choose. Like, do I point, do I grab it? So making choices is a really important way to request, but there are some other behaviors that we need to teach. So to rely on real choices, um, one of these days we can have maybe a talk all about which, which 
kind of milestones to really being able to choose over um, an array of items might take. Requesting by name, so hopefully at some point they'll get to the, you know, request items by the name of the item. Not to forget that we also need to request for things that we don't want anymore, breaks, um, or we can ask just for more or more time for something. We usually don't want to teach more before we teach a lot of labels, otherwise you can learn one word and then you don't have to do anything else. So this is um, just a, like a quick note on teach as many different labels as you possibly can. Um, requesting help and teaching learners to seek assistance, really important and requesting attention. Remember when I mentioned some problem behavior happen until you attend to it, attention is very powerful. And even after the child can already maybe request a few things by name or even by, you know, leading, if they can actually request my attention, so then I look and they can show me all of the other communicative responses. That's an, a really important um, milestone too. So these are just examples of things we teach early on um, to all young learners. So communication and motivation, great. We know all about motivation now. We know the communication responses that we want to teach, but I have a child that doesn't really seek a lot of things or is not saying too many things. How do I make more of it happen? We have a technique that we call contriving. So we just dig for these opportunities. We plan and I call it, we plant. So you plant cues in the environment there that will motivate the child but they can't really obtain them until there's a communicative response in there. Ideas uh, that you might wanna try, start and then stop. Any preferred activities, just like the dad in my example was tickling or you know, jumping up and down with the child. Give the child a toy or an activity that they can't operate. Wind up toys are excellent for that because they're really difficult to do if you have little hands um, and they're super fun. Place an item in a closed container, maybe a clear container where the child can see it's in there, might really motivate them to ask for help or ask for open. Remove a piece of an activity so that to complete it, the child will need to request that. Maybe give one and wait. This cannot be understated. How much we see that, oh, um, great. They just said cookie. Here's the, the little single serve of cookie. Well, there are 10 little cookies in that bag. We can get 10 word cookies. So give one and wait. They might look at the item for more. They might look at you, whatever it takes. You can, you know, contrive more of these. Place the item high on a shelf. Abruptly turn off an activity. Maybe if there's like a, a train uh, on a track, just go play, 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 and then suddenly stop. And or slow down and wait expectantly. I put the wait in caps there because it is really important in these situations to have this kind of pause where you're there. And the child has to realize, oh, something stopped, something happened. It's not restarting. So I usually call ourselves, I want us to be a switch. The child can turn the switch on and can turn the switch off. So if we stop and they realize by looking up at your eyes, they turn the switch on, that's it. You have it. This pause can not be over uh, understated. In, in this type of communication training. So I will show you four videos that I think are in a good sequence of these early milestones for um, the first child is a simple response to look up at Dr. Taylor to continue jumping. And the last child we're gonna see, I can guarantee that when that child started intervention, this is as advanced as it was by looking up. 
but we're going to build this communication to more and more and more by working sometimes on these milestones one at a time. So let me share my sound and my video and then I'll play. We played for a long time here the motivating value would go down right so she's not waiting five minutes to stop she's just going a few seconds and then stopping because his motivation is still pretty high a little more advanced Look up and leap. Just said two things there. There's a there's a rogue uh, skittle there that was not supposed to be there. So I want this, and I want you to put your hand there. Give me a point. But I'll check if there's another rope. See how hard he's trying. I'll point, I'll use your hand, and more and more and again. And then there he goes. He got all of his skittles. We have a lot of activities that the kids want to do and they want to do it until the end. So this is perfect for that. Now it's getting more and more sophisticated. Help me please. Oh, okay. Say so pop them up. Say so pop them up. There, we pop them up. Pop it up. Wind it up. Wind it up. Excellent. You said wind it up. We're going to wind it up. And it's going to go on your mark. Get set. Go. Uh oh. Uh oh. Repeat. On your mark. Yes. Get set. Fill in. Go. Go. Yay. We did it. Yay. I want to point this out here. You see how she pulled the hand like, oh yeah, it used to work like this before. I would just put your hand on and you would make it happen. Not anymore. That hand is just hanging there so that there's a pause so the child can realize, oh yeah, they require more now. But I really want this toy, so I'm going to try. <laughs> Oh, Say, pop them up. Pop them up. Okay, we're going to pop them up. We popped up the pins. Wind it up, please. <laughs> oh, thank you for saying wind Ooh. it up, please. Can you fix your legs, please? Sure. Crisscross. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Here we go. Ready? Set, go. 
set, go! Go, 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 it started with just a look or a handful of candy or jumping on a trampoline for another few seconds. And then it becomes something this beautiful. Um, and this is a, a whole, you know, several minutes of teaching just because she really wants to play with that toy. So the, the motivation is still high. After maybe playing three or four times, she might not be super interested in this toy anymore. But for as long as she is, we're using the fill in, the repeat, pop them up, looking up, try my hand. So there was tons of communication in just this short interaction. And to leave some time for questions, um, I will go through our last slide with just a, a quick uh, overview of our Center for Autism. Um, we are a department of Alpine. Some of you might know Alpine as a school and uh, which it has been for 30 years. The Center for Autism is a department. We provide clinical services, all the green services there. And we also have an in-home intensive ABA program for young learners. We do um, developmental evaluations and diagnostics skills assessments and, and treatment planning, sometimes to identify future placement or to help IEP teams, functional assessments um, for treatment of problem behavior, parent training, school consultation and staff training. And we also have a fantastic social skills group that has been remote for the duration of the pandemic, but we're hoping that by the fall we'll be back on site. I have my email address on the screen and also Karen C. Gans. Um, she can, um, she gets every single call and everyone who wants to know more about our program, you can contact her or myself. The Center for Autism is in network with um, all of these major insurance plans. And there's a little list of resources. Um, Dr. Taylor mentioned the Association for Science and Autism Treatment, which is a really rich, resourceful uh, website for uh, parents and professionals. They translate a bunch of research. They have a lot of answers about questions about other treatments, uh, some media um, information, a book on naturalistic and incidental teaching from, uh, that's the literature from which a lot of this kind of uh, teaching strategy comes from. Activity book, babe, uh, Kid for Babies, is um, has a lot of ideas on how to uh, target some of these communication skills just in the day-to-day -day and activities that have to happen, like diaper changes or eating, taking a bath. Developmental milestones, very comprehensive on the CDC website. And the Hannon Center has a um, really simple uh, parent training and good recommendations for these early communication skills. Thank you again for coming and spending an hour of your evening with us. And we have some time for 